Good afternoon, everyone. It's really a pleasure to greet you. Uh, this is our last uh, great uh, episode, splash episode of Libertades Literarias, Afro Latino America Escribe. Uh, our last episode takes the plunge from Spanish speaking America to Francophone America. As we know, the term Latin America has a Francophone origin because Napoleon was very clever and decided he would make a concept of uh, his future conquest of the area, um, leaving Spain to dwindle in its power, uh, but certainly excluding England from his concept of Latin America. So to include uh, a brilliant Martinican novelist, filmmaker, and uh, essayist uh, is, I think, um, the best way to round off our introduction to uh, Latino America Escribe. Uh, today we have the great honor of inviting um, Fabienne Canor, who will speak with us uh, shortly. Uh, Fabienne, as I say, is a dynamic and uh, well-known uh, award-winning artist. Uh, and we have a contact with Fabienne, thanks to our colleague and friend, uh, Françoise Lyonnais, who will introduce Fabienne to you. Françoise is a past president of the American Comparative Literature Association. Uh, she's professor of Romance Languages and Literatures at Harvard, as well as Comparative Literature and African and African American Studies and Women, Gender and Sexuality, uh, also all at Harvard. Uh, in the fall of 2015, she held the Mary Cornell Distinguished Visiting Professorship at the Newhouse Humanity Center at Wellesley. She remains a distinguished research professor at UCLA because no one wants to give her up. Uh, she taught there from 1998 to 2015, serving first as chair of French and Francophone Studies, and then as director of the James Coleman African Studies Center. Um, her current research focuses primarily on Indian Ocean literary, cultural, and historical studies in relation to Atlantic and Caribbean studies. So uh, you see that Francoise Lyonnais is our guide through the waters uh, on both sides of the globe. And um, we uh, were so honored to have her introduce our brilliant Caribbean artist for today. Uh, Fabienne, please share with us your comments. Oh, so I'm no, excuse me, Francoise. <laughs> Francoise, I jumped in my eagerness. Okay. Thank this you is so much, water. Francoise. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, thank you, Doris, for uh, inviting me to uh, be a part of this wonderful program. I am really honored to be here and delighted to uh, be able to introduce Fabienne. As we were saying earlier, Fabienne came to Harvard to be in my class about three years ago. And now that we're in the world of virtual communication and webinars, it's, um, I'm really delighted to see, uh, to see her uh, this way. So um, without further ado, let me just uh, do give you the full dimension, if I can, of, of Fabienne or Dr. Cano's talents. As uh, Professor uh, Sommer just said, she's an artist, a filmmaker, uh, a writer. Um, and uh, in fact, she was born in France, in Orléans, uh, because her family had migrated there from um, Martinique. Um, I want to begin by just giving an overview of the sort of traditional academic credentials of Fabienne before getting into really the more important part. So Fabienne received her BA from the University of Tours, an MA from the Sorbonne Paris, and a PhD from Louisiana State University. Louisiana State University, which has a terrific French and Francophone studies department, and which has had among its faculty the distinguished writers uh, uh, like Asia Jebar and Edouard Glisson. One of the few remaining single, you know, freestanding French departments in the United States. 
Uh, Fabian's BAs and master's degrees are in modern comparative literature, sociolinguistics, communication studies, and filmmaking. Uh, at LSU, she obtained in 2018 her doctorate in French and Francophone studies and a certificate in women and gender studies. Um, before acquiring what, as I said, could be termed these traditional credentials, uh, Dr. Canoa was already an award-winning filmmaker and fiction writer whose productions defy traditional generic boundaries, ranging broadly from history to fiction, documentary writing and filming to vivid prose and innovative uses of language. Um, Fabienne Canor co-directed with her sister Véronique uh, a film titled La Noire Haude, the first of a planned trilogy of medium length film that explores um, the fate of Caribbean people in France. It was broadcast of, uh, on the French uh, uh, TV, France 2, and on RFO, Radio France Outre-mer, and um, did the film festivals uh, tour and was very well received. Her second film in that and this in, in its series is entitled C'est qui l'homme, which, uh, which examines gender dynamics and assigned gender roles in Caribbean society. Um, she has also made literary documentaries, notably on um, Caribbean writers, Marie Condé and Aimé Césaire. And she has covered Haiti and events in that nation as well. Now, she has published nine literary books four short stories, two plays, and directed half a dozen feature films and documentaries. She's been a resident of the Distinguished Iowa Writers Workshop, worked as a journalist for Radio France, produced audio documentaries on culture and politics in Martinique and Guadeloupe. I'm not sure if she ever sleeps, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but she's best known today for her talent as a writer who can channel the past and render it in searing prose that communicates the survival of history in the present and the way the past affects us all today. In her first uh, fiction um, book, Dodus, um, it was written uh, while she was living for a few years in Saint Louis du Senegal and published in 2004. Uh, it won high praise and received the Fetkan Award, a literary award. After uh, that first book, she um, wrote the stunning Humus, which I believe you have the class has read for today. Yes. Uh, Humus was inspired by her travels uh, in Benin and by an archival discovery, the logbook of a captain of a slave ship in 1774, which reported that 14 women jumped into the sea rather than go on and be enslaved in the, on the ship and in the new world. Humus is a polyphonic text that give voice to these 14 women, highlighting their resistance to enslavement and the middle passage. This year, Humus has just appeared in the English translation by Lynn Palermo, uh, an excellent translation, I believe. And uh, the book has also um, been translated into Spanish and Italian, and it won the Prix RFO du Livre in France. Uh, a book that um, was published in 2014, Faire l'Aventure, was praised as a rare book, an odyssey of disillusion, a chilling exploration of the, document, the undocumented life of an illegal immigrant uh, and the difficult life of um, black migrants in Europe. Some of her other books are notable for their unusual titles. For example, Je ne suis pas un homme qui pleure, I'm not a man who cries from 2016. Les chiens ne sont pas des chats, published in 2008. Dogs Are Not Cats, and a book called Anticor, Antibody. Um, her most recent book has just been published in France and is titled Louisiane. It is, as you can guess, inspired by her years in New Orleans. It is notable for the inventiveness of its prose, the juxtaposition of scenes of everyday life in Black neighborhoods, such as the his historic Treme district in New Orleans, where Canor lived for three years. A powerful denunciation of the conditions of life for Black citizens of New Orleans, Louisiane has been termed a scream of a book, a cri, that helps French readers understand better the context of slavery, poverty, and the Black Lives Matter 
a movement in the United States. Now, uh, she is at work on uh, two, uh, well, on films, on film projects, and, uh, but also on a, uh, I began by talking about academic credentials. She's putting together, completing uh, a study, a critical study that is titled, tentatively titled, Remapping Slavery, Excavating the Contemporary Traces of the Slave Ship's Hold in the French West Indies, France, Africa, and the United States. And finally, I just want to mention the fact that a book about her has just, uh, is just about to come out from Liverpool University Press, an, edi an edited book entitled Fabienne Canor in Transgression, Documenting, Performing, Writing, and Filming the Insufferable. So please join me in welcoming Fabienne Canal to Professor Summer's um, webinar, and um, and I again thank you, Professor Summer, for having me be here to introduce this wonderful, talented Caribbean writer. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Lyonnais. Mm -hmm. I um, I want to say to the public what um, we've been saying these uh, these weeks. Uh, in the series, and that is that this is an opportunity to um, appreciate precisely uh, what you commented, your first comment on the new book about Louisiana, about the verbal uh, inventiveness uh, of oral speech and especially of, uh, of the, uh, the good writing that, uh, that we're celebrating in, in this series. Uh, it's one thing to be locked into uh, impossible uh, themes of discrimination, slavery, uh, the trade, uh, suicide. Uh, these are foisted upon us, but the art with which one can survive and achieve uh, autonomy and freedom of thought is, uh, is what we celebrate with the visit of uh, Fabienne Cano today. And uh, uh, we've, uh, we've already talked about um, her uh, possible contributions. There, they could be many, but I made these comments so that the public uh, uh, understands uh, our decisions, the, uh, the decision to, uh, to focus on that issue of, uh, of your style, of your uh, maneuvering in a language that might not have been chosen by your ancestors. Um, is uh, where we, uh, we invite you to explore today. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. I'm so happy and grateful. So first, I want to thank you, Françoise Lyonnais, for having worked such as a perfect female version of Papa Legba. <laughs> but introduce me to Doris, Doris Summer, and vice versa. You open the gate. Vous avez ouvert la barrière, ouvert by mm -hmm. And you brought me into this magic research circle. So it's a really wonderful pleasure for me to be here. Also, I warmly thank Doris Summer for a phenomenal Obatala energy. As she's at the very origin of, I don't know how to call it, momentum, conversation, dance, or talk, I, I don't know. I don't know yet. I finally thank each of you for your enthusiasm and for your day-to-day -day creativity. By doing what you do, you reinforce our ability as human beings to be present, to come together, to share knowledge and to preserve traces and memories. So as a writer of African descent growing up in the 70s is a super small white town in France, Orléans. I know how crucial it is to go beyond the surface of the Roman National, to go back to the land and cultures left behind 
in my case, I guess that it's somewhere in Africa, West Africa. And to decolonize the language in which we've been used to tell our stories. I hope this session will help us recreate or find at least new energies, new epistemologies. So I've got something for you, just kind of opening sound. So let me find it. Up. So it's exactly the way that we do in a Vodou society, just to call Papa Legba to start a ceremony as we are going to do. So I think it's here. Okay, no, it's not. Oops, okay. So to open the gate, a little more. I would like to quote Marisa Fuentes, author of the book, Disposed Lives. Looking back now, I understand how naive and hopeful I was going into this project. I believed I would find that one source that no one else had yet discovered. I would be able to tell a story from the standpoints and thoughts of the women about whom I wished to write. I would discover a document that revealed the inner everyday lives of the enslaved women in a plain language that I could simply translate, end of quote. The women that Fuentes tries to give voice to are black women, victims of slavery in 18th century Barbados. Fuentes refers to two brutalities, the effective violence suffered by these women in the past and the fact that they have been erased from colonial records. When I went to Gore Island in 2004, and when I heard about these 14 African women escaping the hold of a slave ship and jumping into the sea to regain their freedom, I had to face the same erasure mentioned by Marisa Fuentes. In the colonial archives that I looked into, I couldn't find anything about these women, nothing but a few sentences, some vague information, as if these women had never existed, as if the story was just an anecdote, a footnote. While building my first chapter, the one that I chose to read you today, I had to recreate a specific language that not only showed the loss suffered by the 14 African women, the loss of space, the loss of light, the loss of self-control, the loss of self-esteem, the loss of the body, the loss of the language, the loss of the family, etc. 
but I had to face also my own loss, my own failure. As a writer using the language of the slave owner to report the enslaved women experience, breaking the wisdom of the French grammar, breaking the, the expectations and the habits of my readers, breaking the narrative space and time in the novel became my first challenge. So the first chapter is entitled The Mute One, La Muette. I was too young to learn and too small to glide them to the branches. I remember how to reach the huts where those who are not dead keep their vigil. I knew nothing of the world when they took me. Because I knew nothing of crying, I screamed when water fell from my eyes. So much water behind my eyelids. Oh, was that possible? I gazed at the sky studied the clouds in vain. I looked for the weaver, searched the landscape, nothing. Inside my body, the rain had started. From my wide open eyes, this stream flowed, dragging me far from the village to the sea where the weaver came to lose itself each day with no mouth to name them. The words fell away. Joy, smile, childhood, was hoppers, baobabs, the words sank unspoken. Only much later did I realize it. When nothing was left, I opened my mouth. Emptiness. Silence. One night. Huh. One night they at my belly. The man was alone, but felt like a hundred. Had run out of tears when he came in. I thought only of my fingers in my throat, the fingers that would never be enough to get rid of it all. I would need two, my whole hands, my arm, until this man's water was gone. He never tried again. No doubt knew about my finger. No, I hurt when I look at my hand. My legs tremble. I bleed. Clench my fist and try hard to think of something beautiful. I no longer recall the date or the place. We will just say it was an ordinary day some African town between forest and water. I had immediately been sold my new master's pay the asking price, pressed to set sail after long months of waiting. It had all happened quickly, the hot iron on my skin, the descent below deck, the cries in the hold as the ship weighed anchor. An hour passed, an entire night, a lifetime it seemed. We were so sure 
we'd end our days down there, slapped about by the waves, forgotten, forgetting who we had been. Call them whatever you want. I no longer hold the names in my head. Barely even their face turn to the ocean, facing it, laughing. So was I, I, I did jump, I, I did jump, je, je, nous avons sauté, nous, je, je, nous avons sauté, nous l'avons fait. We did it. It is not a coquetry. When I make the mute woman say twice, I no longer recall the date. I no longer recall the date. It is a way. It is a way to confess my inability as a storyteller to provide my readers and my characters too with accurate data. As I wrote in the preface to Humus, I was not there. I was not on board. I was not locked in the dark, crowded, stinking and oppressive hold of the slave ship. Neither was I on the deck with Captain Louis Monnier and his crew. But because I know this tragedy happened, I cannot make up lies as novelists usually do. You know how they are. You know what it means to tell stories from the author's imagination. It means signing a pact with the readers pretending that the character who inhabit the book are suffering for real, dying for real, eating, dancing, making love, praying, etc. Ultimately, it means telling stories that are not true. But this is a fair deal, a winner, winner pact, if you prefer, since the reader is a liar too. While reading fictions, readers are able to cry, to feel fear, joy, excitement, so woe, as if the story they are reading was true, was theirs even. Writing on such a tragedy forced me to be honest and humble and to build my novel from this statement. Based on two events, the story I'm telling is an unfinished story written in an unfinished language and taken place in an unfinished world. When I write, I did, we jumped together, we jumped, see, jumped, see, jumped, we. Oui. You can feel, you can hear the unfinishedness, the miscarriaged, because there's something here that wants to be born. There's something here that wants to be articulated, to be shared, to be done, in vain. This something refers both to my narrative and to the mute woman's story. We are both losing our breeze. What you need to understand 
is that I felt truly connected to my characters, who ended up no longer being characters, but ancestors to listen to, to take care of. Because back then I was living in a small Senegalese village without electricity, I decided to hand write most of the chapters of Humus. For each woman, I used a cardboard folder in which I stole the testimony little by little. So the mute one, and you won't be surprised, was not very talkative. She didn't want to talk. Sometimes she came to my mind, put a word, two words, three words in the silent room. Words like joy, smile, grasshoppers, baobabs, those that I wrote down on a blank page. The Amazon was the opposite. She kept talking, 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 talking to me, as if she wanted to remind me that being enslaved didn't mean being a slave. This may seem obvious, but it is not. When you decide to write from the hold of the slave ship, you are surrounded with images that are not yours. They come from movies that you may have watched, for example, Roots, the television series, or the docu-fiction Passage du Milieu by Guy Delaurier. They come from the archives you may have consulted, such as the famous diagram of the Brooks slave ship, or some works of art depicting the Middle Passage, such as Turner's slave ship, or La Bouche du Roi by Romuald Azoumé. You may also have in mind books that still haunt you. I think about Feeding the Ghost, Fred d'Aguillard, Le Quatrième Siècle, Edouard Glissant, Mulatres Solitude by Schwarzbart. My point is that when you go into such a project as a writer, you are not innocent of slavery. You cannot immediately capture what needs to be caught. It requires time to which the moment where you will be able to see with your own eyes from an original perspective what your characters show you. To build the Amazon, I read a lot and tried to forget all I had read. I wanted to get her away from the myth the Amazon, so that she would become a mix of modernity, modernity an Afro-feminist heroine. And also I wanted to put tradition, a character for an epic tale, so that my Amazon would become herself. Let me share with you a section of that Amazon. Every man has his day. Every day come in its time. I had just caught a rabbit when attracted by the sea's laugh, I released my prey and followed the path to the coast. Soon, I found myself at the end on the beach where a few years before my mother had gone into the water and seen Yovo. There they were, armed, 
just as they had been in the past. Flanked by her head of Negroes who were neither walking nor moving forward, but under the lash of the whip, were dragging themselves on the ground, crawling along without shame or soul, robbed of the very breeze of life. What kind of people were these Blacks to accept such treatment? Had they lost all pride, giving abject obedience to creatures whom the gods hadn't even bothered to color? Wake up! I bellowed to the captives as I charged the enemy, imitating the wind, rain, lightning, landing blows by the hundreds. Wake up! Faisons de notre vaillance un rempart contre leurs fusils. Frappons ensemble. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Versons le sang. Yovo est tout petit. Nous sommes plus forts que buffle. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look closely at the text, you will see a mix of tradition and modernity. When I write, every man has got his day, or every day comes in its time, these are proverbs that sound traditional and they are made of the multiplicity of African proverbs found in my reading and my research trips. I actually spent three months in Benin, Nigeria, and Togo to take notes. Conversely, I introduce modernity when I make the Amazon say, what kind of people were these Blacks to accept such treatment? the wording of this question and the use of blacks anchors the scene in a contemporary context. It creates an interesting anachronism, which helps us understand that the past is not even past. In many ways, this Amazon is a pioneer of black activism. When it comes to reading a polyphonic novel, we always should pay attention to how the voices resonate with each other, whether they contradict or reinforce each other. In order to amplify the Amazon's voice, I found it effective to insert a monologue between the chapter entitled The Slave and the one named La Blanche. In these other two chapters, the women who speak confess their fragility, their cowardice, their fear. Having a breakable character, then a strong one, then a weak one allows me to provide my readers with a larger spectrum of emotions, experiences, and perspective. My goal was to go against what the colonial administration had done to African people by seeing them as a group rather than individuals, by considering them as livestock, I'm going to quote one of my characters, the mute one at the beginning of monologue. She said, nothing but a thing they use, use up until its inside breaks. Drawn from the last chapter entitled The Errors, the third section I'm going to read and that I will try to analyze has to do with self insertion. She's a heiress, obviously, 
represents me. Me looking for traces that I couldn't find. Me trying in vain to fill the blanks of history. Me going to wider than to bad agree, to get closer to my 14 characters, to better understand what they might have felt, what they might have seen while they were walking to the sea or when they were locked in the barracoons where they were imprisoned by the capture before being deported. Using a self-insert character is very common in literature. I chose to use this technique, but introducing something more. I wanted to stop being the deus ex machina, the one who knows perfectly where the narrative goes. I wanted to show my readers that I too was disoriented, that I too was walking, walking on the African ground, but also wandering on the path of creation. This section is actually a sort of making of designed to reveal what's happening behind the apparently well-built scenes. Writing novels has always been more than a brain and intellectual exercise to me. I write with my body. And the importance of the feet, the belly, the mouth, the finger or the chest in most of my novels, including Humus. While visiting places where the tragedy had taken place, such as the slave market in Badagri, where the Africans were sold and bought, I recorded my voice using the techniques of automatic speaking, which I prefer to call psycho body orality. Before reading, I would like to share with you that picture. That one, exactly that one. Let me put that one. Okay, you can see it. So yeah, this is a long time ago. I'm standing on the sandy amnesic, amnesiac beach because she doesn't understand that I want more information. She just stopped talking to me. Back then I was wondering, as I just said, on the rendering on the arcana of the creation trying to find one chapter, two, third chapter, I don't know. And I'm looking for the women. I'm looking for my story. And maybe I'm looking for my roots too. So this is the bad agree beach. And as you can see, I've got a, a little bag in which I remember having put my voice recorder. So I can, maybe I can keep it that way because I've got the reading to do. So maybe you will figure out how it was better if I do that. So the reading now, and it will be the last one for today. Night is fading when I leave the city and takes the road to Rida, wedged between a wicked door and a reckless driver. 
I do weaken the trees, the sky, a wooster, my head bobbing to the rhythms of this coupe de calais, whose meaning will remain a mystery. Unto this stretch of land that seems to cradle the ocean, I toss my dreams like a oppo my thumb, looking for la blanche. The old woman who's listening me smiles, sings the song, the story of a young girl who went to the well and never came back. When the white men arrived, they brought with them things they traded with people. For four things, they would take two men. For six things, they would take three. A little here, a little there. They traded people luck at the market. When you give fish and take gari, when you give corn to take pimentos. My own grandmother was brought this way. She was for Nigeria. She walked several days before reaching with her. You go out of the village to do water at the well and they grab you. They strip you of your joy, your strength. Sometimes they beat you. And if you are lucky, maybe you do not die. You cannot say yes, you cannot say no. Sometimes if you come with your child in tow, they take you both. You have no power. That's the way it used to be. But people don't understand today. Go see the slave trail, maybe there. Dawn, dawn breaks over the trail. Seven, set, set cercle. I walk around the tree of forgetfulness to no avail, no one, just the sky, pale and sweetening, to split open at any moment, seven times, nothing, except the belly laugh of the Zemijan, the motorcycle taxi, the city's breeze. Where are you? The question hangs in the air. What must I do to set the memory in motion? Where is the sea anyway? What's it doing? I can hardly hear it. Yes, it's there. I learned that from my school books. Is the world telling the truth? The sea should be down there at the end, at the end with a big, a big, a big ship that will probably take us far away. I don't want to go. I'm crying. I don't want to go, sobbing, even if my feet keep stepping forth and my body says yes. So right after that, I need to share the screen again because I've got that section from a performance. And you know, when I talk about les sept cercles around the trees, just to remember who you used to be. I think that this performance tell exactly this story.
when I ask where is the sea, I cannot see it. Or when I ask, for example, what can I do to set my memory as an African descent in motion? Do I have to use the words, French words to tell that story? Do you have to try to get my body back, to get my memories back? and to try to dance, to try to find a movement, a language that would be able to report this experience. Share. Okay. Oh, and so okay. it's not it's not the end. <laughs> yeah. But you know the, the the feeling that we can get when you when we try to do something with the tragedy and you want to keep it original, but at the same time this is how to start and how to put the end of your story. It was exactly uh, the emotions that I could feel back then, how to do it. Do I have to do it? So I would like to focus on the section where the old Beninese female characters tells the heiress, who is a character, the history of slavery. At least what she learned from that period. Most of her words are true. I didn't invent them. They come from a woman I met that day I was walking on the beach. The way she uses repetition in her phrases, a little here, a little there. When you give a fish, when you give corn, oh, you cannot say yes, you cannot say no. Sounds like a song sounds like a tell. As she was not talking about slavery as a tragedy, but a daily experience that her ancestors were used to. The fact that she compares it with a market transaction changes our understanding of the Atlantic trade. It was not an Atlantic phenomenon. It was not only the story of tons and tons and tons of slave ship coming to the African coast and getting what they paid for. What the old woman reminds us is that it took place everywhere, that it got so intense so ordinary that everybody, unless they were a powerful king, could be taken, could disappear in a matter of seconds. In that section, you see, you can see how I stall despite my effort to set the memory in motion. The use, for example, of question marks the use of different verb tenses clearly illustrate the end of certainties. As I reached the slave coast and the very end of my novel, I lost my power as narrator author. My sentences no longer make sense. There is no way for me to make affirmations and direct my story. Now, this section also, I think, is really important if we want to examine the voice and the role of the ocean in the novel. After reading Mus, many people ask me where the 14th character was. And indeed, 
if we refer to the table of contents, we only count 13 African women. The twins, so one sister, the second sister, the mute woman, the old woman, the slave, the Amazon, La Blanche, the employees, the little one, the queen, the one who flies, the mother, and the heiress, so 13 characters. Well, we have to look elsewhere to find the 14th woman's voice. We have to accept the fact that her voice no longer exists. The ocean swallowed it when the 14th captive dived into the sea. When the novel starts, this human voice has already been transformed by the clamors of the Atlantic Ocean. Before writing Humus, it was clear in my mind that I had to find a way to report these clamors. I first thought that I would just have to go to the beach at different times of the day with my record, <laughs> recorder to record the sound of swells and waves. I thought it would be easy. I thought that I would reproduce them in writing and I really tried to do it. I tried to fill pages with onomatopoeia. I can still see myself trying to write on a blank page, oh, ah, e, oh, you know, trying to imitate the Atlantic and eventually realizing that it didn't really work. Who else but me could understand my purpose? I also thought about using the major water spirit, Yemanja, as a goddess narrator. But I didn't know how to do it technically and with respect. Then I had this idea. Why not use sea shanties to accompany each woman's story? So I've got one shanties. Je pars pour un long voyage et sur la mer avec mon bel équipage. Il sera mon réconfort. Il faut hisser les voiles. So, if you cannot understand what he said, just say, yeah, well, when we all go to the island, you might find a lot of women who will try to seduce you. So that's, uh, that's a shanty, one of the shanty that we used. Well, that's actually, this is an original song which designed to accompany the sailor's labor on board the ship. So it seems to me that using some of the shanty would allow me to personify the Atlantic Ocean of the slave trade. Had realized that this sea couldn't belong to African women. It couldn't act for them as a spokesperson since he had murdered them. It had beaten them, eaten them, taken them away from their countries. In the section, the errors that I've just read, please note that when I make the heroes say, where is the sea anyway? Or what is it doing? 
or I can hardly hear it, or when I use the conditional tense, the C should be down there. My aim is to emphasize my distrust as an author self-insert and also an African descent of this antagonist character embodied by the ocean. So this is almost the end of my talk, but I want to share a song. We start with a song and I want to, to end up with a song. And you may recognize what is it, because I talk about Papa Legba, but also Yemanja. So I think it was an attempt to introduce her again, to put her in a way in humus. Raise the volume. Can you see it? Yes, raise the volume. Okay. Oh, that's the thing. I think that it's the maximum, unfortunately. Um. So at least you can see the pictures, but yeah, yeah, manja. I'm sorry, I want to, to keep uh, <laughs> the sound forever, but because you, you cannot uh, hear it. So I think it's better to end up with just a note by Yemanja. So thank you so much thank you. for your attention. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Fabienne. This was so very, very beautiful, so brilliant. Um, I, I want to give our public a moment to uh, post questions if they, if they like. Um, I just, um, I wanted to say two very brief uh, footnotes. Uh, one is that um, we're hoping to have a, a meeting, not only of one writer at a time, but together, to think together about what a Afro-Latin American uh, literary criticism may be in the future. Because you've touched on many important points. The, the consciousness, the self-consciousness and calling attention to your reader that we've lost information that we don't know, that making things up is um, an act of um, creativity, but also irresponsibility when you don't remember the loss. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, I think, a particular contribution uh, that uh, we might make to literary criticism about the Americas, about the uh, experience of constructing the Americas on this industry of the slave trade. The other thing, which is a short footnote, is that of course, uh, as you say, you have 14 uh, characters. You don't have uh, an undistinguished group or uh, cohort or uh, lot of uh, merchandise, uh, but it's not one character. You haven't centered your novel on one heroine. The, the kind of shared attention to a series of fascinating characters is another important contribution. And you make me think of a parallel with the movement of Black Lives Matter. There's not one patriarch who is inspiring us. It's a rhizome of different kinds of energies with one mission. And um, I think that's an important, um, feminist contribution that you're making. Uh, so 
I, I so much appreciate your uh, bringing us along with you to the decision-making process, to your own questions, uh, to not having to resolve them all, but to turn them into uh, more captivating art. I'm so moved and so grateful to you, Fabienne. You really are, um, you know, el broche de oro, as I said to you, uh, the, uh, the golden buckle that ties us all together in this series. Uh, I don't know if, um, I don't see uh, questions and answers. It says no open questions. Um, do, we, do we have a, a Q&A possibility that's open? Peter, Jose. Oh, here we have a comment here. Love you, Fabienne. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, just to uh, to follow up what you what you were saying about you know the group and the feminism. Um, if I need to get back uh, to that first time when I heard about these fourteen African women in Gore Island, what really struck me was. Uh, the group, the fact that they did it, they jumped into the sea without probably know each other, and they just in a night decided to go, to go outside of the slave ship. Mm -hmm. And I remember that sentence from the colonial archives, uh, there was nothing but in that silence, because it was such a victory. The fact that they managed to create a, a group and then to put their strengths and their hope in the common and say, okay, whatever it happens, we go, we go, we leave the boat. And even if the end is very tragic because seven of them will, will died, actually devoured by uh, the, the sea. We can, we can say that the sea and the rest of the group had to go to IT, but still they did it together, together. And the togetherness shows us that it was about that. It was about saving your own life for sure, but also to do it together, together. Yeah. And I, I, I was really, what I really enjoyed was to take the group as a strength, as a, a miracle and just to say okay now i'm gonna to divide maybe but just to keep you as a group yeah. so in the novel there was there's not uh there's for example one starts the beginning of the story and then others keep writing the story and it creates a movement like the sea actually that shows us how it's possible in martinique uh, uh, we, uh, we used to say uh, un grain de riz fait un sac de riz. A rice seed plus white seed make a big bag of, of rice. And so I, I, I feel that way, that they put me in the group and they say, okay, Fabienne, let's try to, uh, to tell that story together, together. Now, Fabienne, just as a... Uh, a a testament to your enchantment. Uh, there were no questions until we stopped and I invited people and now we have several. Ah. If, if, you have, if you have some, uh, some more time and energy, uh, I know people will be very grateful to hear. Uh, yeah, your I, I can take some questions because now it's uh, not 10. So I can stop at 10 if you okay. all agree with that. It's okay? Yes. yes. Yeah? Okay. okay. So Timothy Byram asks, when you were discussing the possibility of narrating the 14th woman as Yemaya, you said you did not know how to do it technically or respectfully. How do you decide whether a voice can be narrated respectfully? How do you decide when to give up on a technique? Yeah. yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that's a very good question because actually if I have to be honest for each woman, I thought that I couldn't do it respectfully, even for human. So we talk about a goddess, but not for women. 
it was hard because I thought that I didn't have the right, for example, to create a name for each of them. For example, the Amazon, her name, I just decided that she, maybe her name is that or this. And so it was very painful to me just to understand that I have to make up lies. And so uh, I, I was afraid of not to respect them, but again, to erase them from, uh, you know, the truth at least, to make them visible, but the way I wanted to make them visible. So even for human being, for these women, I thought it was not really fair. And for example, the reason why I didn't choose names, some have a name, but as you can see, when you see the, the, the contents, I call them the Amazon or the little one or the one who flies because yes. I didn't want to decide how they will be called because I, again, I was not there. So why that one should be named Fatou or Awa Fatimata? Because I do not know because I was not with them. Yes. So it was difficult for me to a point just yes. to decide to regain my freedom as a writer, yeah. as a novelist. Yes, and, it, and it's also performing a loss not being mute yourself, but yeah. calling attention yeah. to that loss. Uh, Aaron Witcher asked, um, he says, you began today by evoking Wudu. The Mambo is likewise quite present in Umus. To what extent did Wudu inflect your writing in this novel? It, as an oral tradition, did it help you deconstruct the French language? If so, how? Hmm. A uh, very good question. It's uh, on the making of, of the book. It helps. It just helps to uh, dive into uh, the, Vodi so the Vodou society because back then I uh, had a lot of friends who were initiated. And so I just understood that maybe I need to first to ask the permission because, you know, let me show you something. It is on my table. So it will be a, a, a possible answer. That one is typically for ceremonies. And uh, when I'm on stage, I usually use it just to ask the permission before starting to move my body, to go to the audience, to start to talk or to read my text. It is exactly the same in my creation. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to talking with the ghost and to make the ghost talking, it's necessary to ask the permission. So what I learned from several trips in Haiti is exactly that. You cannot just want to create to make a story or to make a story straight. And so there's a character X and a character is not about that. It's also about, do you really, I mean, do you have the right to tell these stories? Because we know that all these people who were locked into the hold of the slave ship, they ask for goddess, for God, just, you know, a way to be free. Yeah. And so me trying to report an experience, which is not only a human experience, it is really about women and men and girls and, and kids and the whole world trying to ask, to have the conversation with the gods who maybe disappeared because at the end of the day, they were alone in a way. And so I found uh, that 
it was more respectful to me as a writer. Again, I'm not the deus ex machina. I'm not a goddess either. And so it was a way for me to do it before. I remember before, for example, writing the last chapter entitled The Heiress. I did a circle, I dance. I, I just tried to get a conversation because I was not sure that I will be allowed to do that. So it's more about the making of. Do I have the right to put my shoes into my feet into their shoes to pretend to know a little about this extreme experience without asking for the permission to talk, to testify, yeah. to yeah. testify. Yes. yes. So, you know, in the book in itself, especially with the volante, for example, the one who flies, she's of course, a mix of, because I talk about uh, Cécile Fatima, about a mambo, about uh, the ceremony of Bois Caïmans. There's so many uh, references, historical references. I try to intertwine uh, uh, fiction and uh, events and, and truth and lies and legend and reality and modernity and tradition. So for me, uh, just to put these uh, references were enough. I didn't want to make the perfect member. The one who flies is clearly a combination between la soucouniante, we, we named that uh, la soucouniante in Guadeloupe, uh, could be a man too. There are people who have the possibility to uh, remove their skin and to become someone completely invisible. So they can do whatever they want to do. They can go wherever they want to go, watch the neighbors. Usually this is not a bad, uh, bad people, but kind of. You may be afraid of this uh, kind of people because they know how to fly. And also, we also know the legend of Igbo walking on the sea and uh, the, the use of the flying person in all our literatures. So I wanted to intertwine also this uh, tradition yeah. into real things uh, such as a ceremony voodoo. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. You, you practically um, answered, you may wanna say more uh, the next, maybe the last question. Can you speak more about lying and truth telling in fiction, both on the writer's part and the reader's? Uh, this is uh, by Lynette Lewis. Um, I, maybe I can uh, add uh, 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 an addendum to that question because it has to do with uh, narrating as testimony, uh, which assumes, you know, truth telling, but it also assumes a responsibility, you know, uh, so can you not yeah. tell? Can you not lie? Can you not narrate? Is mm -hmm. another way to ask the question. Yeah, uh, this is a very important question. And you know, not only, for example, in my experience as a writer, uh, having written Humus, but also having written a more contemporary book, Faire l'Aventure, which is about migration and also testimony. Yeah. And so, I, I, so I, I can say that uh, this is a big problem because maybe uh, being also a filmmaker, I, did, I made a lot of documentaries. So it's about truth, but not really truth because there's a mise en scène. And I found that maybe I had to write an essay rather than a novel, multiple times I, I wanted to do that because I felt myself, yeah, liar. And so maybe to keep you honesty, at least to be honest, is to be dedicated, committed to report what you can hear. 
So this is a mystical part now that uh, I, I try to bring in the novel. I couldn't tell the story from nothing. So I used the truth, but then I used the truth of writing because there's also a truth of the act of writing. Are you honest when you start to write? Do you really have to, to, to say something or is it just an activity for you? And because I put the more, uh, I mean, I put a lot of honesty in my process. I did it quietly, but I was very focused on what I wanted to write. And you know how, for example, you can use a word, but not that word, for example. You don't just want to, to make a story or to tell a story. You also have to create a specific language, a sophisticated language, and the energy you put on doing it could compensate the lack of honesty in a way, because you just are professional. Yeah. You know, but for faire l'aventure, I think that more than, uh, yeah, faire l'aventure, I felt uh, it's not, too much during the act of writing is after you feel bad because you just question the power of art, what it is for, what did you manage to do. Now you've got all the testimonies, the testimonies of enslaved women, the testimonies of migrant young men, and now can you change the world with that? Is it just something you try to do for yourself? Or do you really want to reverse as a dynamic? And so it was exactly the question. The question, art, I mean, is useful, of course, but there's a, something like a, I don't know, this is the limitedness of, of the art, especially in such a topic, so violent, and you can don't do anything but being locked into your room, just, you know, to write your characters, to build your characters, to write your story without going outside too much. So what kind of art it is? Okay. Is this concrete, this is a weapon, or this is a mic, this is, you know, I think it's a wonderful worry uh, to continue the conversation, as I say, in uh, a group. Uh, I'm convinced that your art leaves the gates open, that it's the work of Velegba, who is the, the rhetorician, yeah. and makes one own the voice. Uh, it doesn't fix history, mm -hmm. but it demonstrates such power and autonomy that it inspires mm -hmm. to for change. Doesn't I hope like yeah. art? It's always indirect and powerful. So okay. please, everyone, join me in thanking so sincerely, uh, so gratefully, this generosity and brilliance that is Fabienne Cano. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Francoise. Thank you, all of you. Thank you.